Good morning, everyone. It's good to be worshiping with you. Uh, my name is Jared. Welcome to everyone online. Let's go ahead and stand together as we worship together.
welcome you, Lord. Let's just pray in this morning. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that we can meet with you wherever we are in a building with other followers of yours, uh, whether at home or in some other space uh, on a vacation in another state. Lord, we're connected to you at the deepest level. And so, Lord, we want to invite you, God, even now, because you love us and you want to encounter us with your love and your mercy and your grace and your truth, we invite you, Lord, into our hearts and minds even now. God, we want to take this time and dedicate it and set it apart. God, what do you want to show us? What do you want to reveal? What do you want to expose? What do you want to heal? What do you want to restore? What do you want to transform? God, we are your children, your sons and daughters, and we're inviting you, God. We're not resisting. We're inviting you, God, to come and do your deepest work. Do it in this place. Do it in this hour, we pray. And if you believe that, say it with me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. If you're here in the building, why don't you grab a seat? We're so thrilled that you're here. My name is Jose. And if we haven't met yet, I'd love to meet you at the end. And uh, thank you, Jared. Thank you for uh, leading us in worship. We'll be ha having more singing here in a little bit. I want to say a special shout out to our friends online. Jody, good morning. Taylor, Turkington, we love you. The Probst, uh, good morning to you. And uh, good morning from Manzanita, the Stickas. We love you. And why did you move away? Anyway, you have a house in Manzanita, but you're still a part of our church family here. Nancy, Bill, Van Warmers, we love you. So we are a church that's here in a building and here in spaces, and we're here a part of a church that's also connected. And that's just the nature of church these days. And the church is growing, even in the middle of all that's going on in our world. And uh, I wanted, before we get into our Bible study, if you have a Bible, go to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. But a couple of uh, welcomes. We have a newborn, uh, so, so many of you know Lonnie, who's been one of our worship leaders here, and on our team. This is uh, Wells LaRue Marlia. We have a photo, yes, oh, she's, yeah, you should clap because she's probably watching from the hospital. <laughs> Austin and Lonnie, we love you, and um, Wells was born on the 19th, my wife's birthday as well, exactly at 1 o'clock exactly seven pounds, exactly 19 inches. There's like precision with this child. You're like a guaranteed straight A student, right? Anyway, uh, but a little, a little quick note from uh, Austin and Lonnie. I just wanted to read to you because they said, oh, we love our church family. Uh, this is a word from them. Thank you for everyone for your kind words, your encouragement, and your prayers. Uh, we definitely felt them through this whole process. And we're, we're all doing well. Uh, Lonnie writes, I'm healing well, and our baby's passing all of her tests and is happy and healthy. Obviously, that's from a mom who hasn't had sleepless nights yet, but we rejoice. <laughs> anyway, we rejoice in, in uh, what God's doing in our church family. Well, uh, just so you know, if, you were, if you're seated here, if uh, you're online, you need to go to our website and download it. Uh, download it. This week's uh, community group discussion guides, uh, if you're a part of one of our communities, we're taking Sundays and then talking about it. And this is huge. If you're newer to our church or you're visiting, welcome. Uh, this is part of who we are. But the other important part is we talk about what God's showing us on Sundays, and we want you to be involved in that kind of discussion. For three times a year, in the winter, spring, and the fall, we take seven weeks in a row, and we ask people to get together in person or online and talk about what they're hearing. And so if you're not a part of one right now, no problem. Take the community group guide, download it, find one other person, and activate your faith. Faith comes by more than just hearing, listening. It's by doing, right? If we hear the word only and we don't do anything, we're actually deceived, James tells us. And the truth isn't living in us. So we want to press into how to live out what we're hearing. And these guides are hopefully just one tool. All right, make sure you grab that, download it at home. Uh, I'm delighted that for the next couple of weeks here, uh, we're going to hear from one of our founding elders, Steve Marshman. He's taught here so many times. Uh, but for some of you, you're new to the community, you may not know Steve uh, not only was an elder at the church that planted us and was an elder here for many years, but he is a former Air Force fighter pilot, which I love to repeat because you just don't you just don't get that job, right? That that's that's a, a hard earned task, as well as a successful business entrepreneur and investor, and a husband and a father and a granddad. And this guy loves the Bible, 
And so I would encourage you, if you don't know many people who love the Bible, find someone. Because his life has been shaped by the scriptures. And he's really made it his goal in, in these years of his life to help everyone he knows know the Bible better. So he's going to be walking us over the next few weeks through some of the more challenging parts of Revelation. So join me in welcoming our good friend and brother, Steve Marshman. We love you, Steve. And a, a, a COVID hug. COVID a hug. COVID hug. Jose, COVID hug. love you, brother. I don't know if you guys know this, but Jose and I go back. We were trying to figure out how many years, and I guess we're both too old to remember. But a while back, and Jose's a good friend. He's also my pastor, like he's your pastor. And I, I'm just so thankful to be here today, and I'm going to brag on Ho Jose just a little bit. I'm so proud of him to think about doing this book not like so many people who said, oh, COVID, we got to do the book of Revelation. This was on the plan a couple of years ago. This has been in the works a couple of years ago. So uh, I'm excited to be here. Welcome to those online, including my lovely bride, Vicki. I love you. 37 years. I hope we have. Well, I hope we don't have 37 more years. I want to be with Jesus. But love you. Uh, thank you to my brother, Mike and Shay, sitting in the living room with her. She has leukemia, so being here is a little tough. But she gets her second shot next Sunday. Actually, while we're here, she'll be getting shots. So uh, hopefully two weeks after that, she'll develop some antibodies and be able to be here and worship with us. Because uh, how many of you know my wife, Vicki, and love her? Vicki, I wish you could see this. There's a lot, of, a lot of fans. She's a wonderful woman. Gave me two wonderful daughters who married two godly men. And now we have four grandkids. And life is good. That baby picture, Lonnie, if you're online listening... Wow, congratulations. I love baby pictures. You're not going to sleep for six months, but don't worry. After that, you'll, come up, you'll, you'll wake up and go, wow, this baby's actually amazing. So, <laughs> but uh, today we're going to do something a little bit different. It's a, let me give you a roadmap for what we're going to do today. Because it's been seven weeks since we were in the book of Revelation, we're going to do a review. Now, the last seven weeks were super important for the church 26 West Church, if you're new here, if you're not new here, you need to go back and listen to those seven weeks of messages if you haven't, because they're super important foundational messages for the church. But since it's been a while, we're going to do a review. We're going we're gonna to talk about the first seven chapters of Revelation, which Jose and I did one preach through in November and December, and that review will kind of catch us up all together. And then to help us out for the next chunk of weeks, which get a little confusing, the challenging part of Revelation, we're going to do an overview of chapters 8 through 16. And then we'll finish up today, we'll actually cover five specific verses that talk about the seventh seal, and that's chapter 8, 1 through 5. So that's, that's our plan for today, Over, uh, review, overview, and then the seventh seal. Sounds good? Good. You guys ready? Yeah. I, I can tell you're all smiling right now. Thanks for wearing masks, by the way. Uh, this COVID stuff is crazy. All of us are so tired of it. I can't wait for it to be over and just hug somebody that I haven't seen for a while. It's going to be great. I want to start today with a quick illustration to kind of set the tone of how we're going to cover this. I was on a drive about, oh, five, six years ago. It was a 10-hour drive, and I was going to be solo. Now, I'm not a big book on tape fan, and I think it's because I have ADD. I tend to listen to a book on tape, and then next thing you know, I'm daydreaming, looking at trees and whatnot. i got to rewind the thing. But this time I said, all right, 10 hours, I get a book on tape, I'm going to really focus. And I drive a 2008 pickup truck, so it doesn't have an iPhone hookup or any kind of fancy. All it's got is a CD player. But fortunately, it's a six CD changer. This, is, this was big time in 2008. So I put all six, first six CDs of the book in there. Started listening to the first one, and I'm tracking. I'm doing better than I've ever done before on a book on tape, and I'm tracking pretty good. And then it flipped over to the, to the next CD, CD number two, and it was getting, the road was getting kind of loud, so I turned up the volume. I reached up, turned up the volume, got it a little bit louder. And then I started getting confused. And this author started talking about characters I hadn't heard of. He hadn't introduced them. He's talking about different places they're at, and he hadn't talked about that. And I'm thinking, man, this author doesn't know anything about how to write a book. You have to introduce a character. You have to tell me if you're going to go to a different country. And I was so confused, I looked up, and I noticed when I turned up the volume, I had accidentally hit random play. <laughs> like, oh, no wonder I'm so confused. And that function, by the way, is for when you want to shuffle songs, right? That's not for when you're listening to a book on tape. For some of us, 
That's the way we feel when we read Revelation. Let's face it. We read Revelation like this is on random play. Like we're, we're talking about seals and the next thing you know there's a dragon. And then we're talking about trumpets. Next thing you know there's a beast and then another beast. And 666 and four, all this stuff. And you just feel like, ah, it's so random. So what I want to do today is help you get organized and get off random play with the book of Revelation. So we're going to throw up the first slide that reviews where we've been. The first seven chapters. And these sermons are out there. Go listen to them. They're back from uh, November and December. But quick overview of uh, uh, a review of what happened. Chapter 1 main point was John's vision of Jesus glorified. Chapter 2 and 3 was the vision of the seven churches. And then chapter 4 and 5 are this incredible throne room vision. And the important part of that section is that Jesus is the Lamb. And then chapter 6, we move into the six seals. And the six seals culminate in what's called the day of the Lord. And if you haven't watched the Bible Project video on the day of the Lord, please go do that. Because it's really, really helpful to understand the book of Revelation. And you'll find out the day is the day of, the, of wrath, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. These are all talking about the same day. There's a bunch of mini days in the Bible, but there's just one future day where Jesus is going to come back and bring an end to the evil kingdom. And that, we call that the great day of wrath, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. And then chapter 7, which was the last message Jose preached at the very end of December, is an interlude. Because we get the six seals and then there's a pause. We don't go right to the seventh seal. So you might think, oh, we hit random play. But no, that's there for a purpose. And the purpose was to give us hope. And this interlude was discussing God's people around the throne. So I'm going to walk through these chapters a little bit more detail now and remind you of stuff that mostly has already been said. So this is a review, but let's face it, it was over two months ago for some of this stuff, so you may have forgot, because I forget stuff all the time now, right? Short-term memory and long-term memory are having a battle in my brain. So let's go to chapter one. First three words in Greek, I don't know Greek, but I've read this enough to know this is true. Everybody would agree with this. The first three words in the book of Revelation in Greek are apocalypse, Jesus, Christ. Three words, apocalypse, Jesus, Christ. Christ. Now, our English translations translate one of two ways, the revelation from Jesus Christ or the revelation of Jesus Christ, and both are correct, and the point of this review point right now is the book is all about Jesus. It's from Jesus. It's of Jesus. It's about Jesus, and we want our church to know as much about Jesus as possible. We know as much as we can so that we could serve him the best we can. Jose and I were talking before the gathering, and we were just excited that we get to do this again with another group of people and all the people online, that we get to tell more people about Jesus. But who better to tell us about Jesus than Jesus himself? This is a gift to us from Jesus. He's going to reveal. See, that word apocalypse in today's English, unfortunately, doesn't mean what it meant in the first century. When you hear somebody say apocalypse today, they mean end times destruction. That's not what it meant in the first century. What it meant then was revelation. That's why it's the book of Revelation. Apocalypse meant reveal or unveil. You can picture an artist gallery where you come in and the, the, the artist made this beautiful sculpture and there's a veil over it and there's a big ceremony and then the artist pulls back the veil from the statue, and we see more about it. And that's what's going to happen in this book as we get into it and study it. We're going to see more of Jesus. We're going to be more, uh, it's, Jesus is going to be more revealed to us. So we're going to do a little game right now, a mental game, because that's always fun, right? And uh, if you want to close your eyes in just a second, I'll have you do that. But here's how this is going to go. I'm going to shout out three Bible characters, and I want you to make a mental picture of what this person looks like and what they're doing. Okay, does everybody get? So if you wanna, if you want to, if if you wanna close your eyes, that might help you because it'll help with what's my mind's picture. So here we go. The first first character, Noah, and in your mind's eye picture, what does Noah look like and what's he doing? All right. The second mental picture, Moses. Moses, mental picture of what he looks like, 
And what is he doing? And if you're my age, you're probably picturing Charlton Heston from the movie. But, uh, all right, third mental picture, you ready? Last one. Jesus. What's he look like and what is he doing? Now, quick show of hands. When I said Jesus and you, you have a picture of what he looks like and what he's doing, how many people picture Jesus as he appears in one of the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Show of hands. How many people pictured that? You did. Others in the back. whole bunch of people. What else did you picture? Anybody else that wasn't seeing Jesus from the Gospels? What else were you, what else were you thinking or seeing? Anybody? Pardon? Resting on the throne. Good one. Another one? Anybody? Shout it out with a thick mask. You had a picture of something. On the, cross. on the cross. Yeah, that's a good one too. And hear me loud and clear. Those are good pictures. If most of you, if you were picturing some story out of, out of the Gospels, that's good. Retain that. Keep that. But as Jose said in his sermon about chapter 1, we need to have a bigger, improved, better picture of Jesus. I like to think of it as a collage. Jesus is God. So he's more than just one thing. He's multiple things. So you might picture Jesus as a baby focusing on his incarnation. You might uh, focus him with talking to a disciples or on the cross or in the revelation. You might picture him on the throne. You might picture him as John describes him in chapter 1. If you look at the end of chapter 1, you need to turn there now. But remember, John gives us this vision of Jesus that's spectacular. He's a high priest, and he's wearing a robe with a golden sash. He has white hair, and this is a little spectacular, eyes like blazing fire. And this is like stuff of, uh, of some kind of crazy fiction, but it's not. This is actually John's vision of what Jesus is like today. He has a face like the sun, just blaring out like the sun. It might remind you of the transfiguration. It's pretty similar to that. Notice, though, that in this description, there's a lot of this word like. It's a simile. What's going on is this is apocalyptic literature. And as apocalyptic literature, we have to realize that things are communicated to us through visions and symbols. That doesn't mean they're not real. It just means that the visions and symbols represent reality. I personally don't think that Jesus literally had a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It sounds painful. I don't think Jesus would do that. So what is that? That's a symbol. It's a symbol of God speaking divine just justice. And we're going to see that throughout uh, Revelation. And it actually comes out of the Old Testament. So something to remember as we go through this book is we have to read it appropriately for the type of literature it is. It's apocalyptic literature communicated in symbols and images. Okay, so chapter 1, just an amazing picture of Jesus. I would encourage you to go read it again this afternoon or tonight. Chapter 2 and 3, I'm not going to spend much time on that because, frankly, those are the easiest chapters in the book. It's good to have a couple easy chapters. But they're important. Why are they important? Why are they there? Part of the reason they're important is for us to know that Jesus knew everything about the first century churches, all seven churches. He knew them inside and out. He knew their troubles, and he encourages them. At the end of every one of those seven church messages, there's a word about how we are to be victorious in Jesus. And that's encouraging. You can go read those. One of the things that is encouraging to me is Jesus knows everything about 26 West. Everything. Believe it or not, Jesus knows more about 26 West Church than Jose does. You believe that? He does, right? Jose's working it. The team's working it. They're working really hard. COVID's tough on churches, but Jesus knows everything there is, and he knows how to encourage us. Okay, chapter 4 and 5. This is the throne room scene. And there's one thing I really, really, really want us to take away from the throne room scene. It's this most important vision the most important vision in the entire book of Revelation. John is told to look, see the Lion of Judah. And he looks, he turns and looks, and he sees a lamb on the throne as slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And that image is the central image of the whole book of Revelation. The lamb wording will be used something like 28 times throughout the book, and it's important for us to look at that and go, that 
is the main image of the book. Jesus, the lamb, slain, seven horns, seven eyes. That means Jesus is the final sacrifice. Jesus is all-powerful, and Jesus is all-seeing. That's what that imagery represents. Now, a word on this imagery. It's tough for some of us, right? Because we don't typically, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't read a lot of apocalyptic literature. But this is the last book of the Bible. It's the end of the story, so it's important. Why don't you imagine something right now with me? Imagine a first century Christian in John's day reading this book, and he jumps in a time machine and tra is transported to 21st century Portland. Well, first of all, where would the person be? Probably a coffee shop, right? So the first century person sitting in Portland, 21st century, in a coffee shop, drinking coffee, picks up a paper, and the paper says this. This weekend is the civil war between the ducks and the beavers. Imagine what a first century person would think about when he reads it. Like, well, why are the ducks and the beavers fighting? This is not natural enemies. It just makes no sense to this person because he's been transported out of his culture out of his understanding of the imagery. So we know that the ducks represent the University of Oregon. Beavers represent Oregon State. The Civil War is the way we talk about the football, football game between the two. Well, the same thing happens in reverse. When we go from the 21st century back to the first century eyes and read this book as we were looking at it through first century lenses, there's some symbology that we don't get. Good news, though. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And almost all the imagery comes from the previous section of the Bible. And even though it appears hard at first, if we do the work and look up these images, it'll help us a ton. So to understand this book, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to look through the first century eyes, look at the Jewish pool of images, look at the cultural images of the day. Frankly, when... Tim Reed, my friend Tim Reed and I put together this podcast, which Jose's mentioned, but I'll mention it again here. The way, easiest way to get to is go to the website and then download the podcast onto whatever device you have. But the website is arevelationconversation.com. You have to have the A in front, arevelationconversation.com. And that podcast series is 28 podcasts that go through the whole book of Revelation verse by verse. The longest episode is 30 minutes. The average is about 25 minutes, so it'll take you about 12 hours in total. You know, you don't do it all in one day. Just do it over time as keep track with the sermons, if you will. And the point of that whole exercise was to give you a jump start into what the imagery is all about. What these, these phrases that you read, what's the hidden manna? What's the white stone? You know, the dragon is easy because John says the dragon is Satan. What's the beast, the second beast, all this stuff. We talk about all that stuff, and it's there to help you. And we, we know that you still have to internalize this and study it for yourselves, but what we're trying to do is to help you out. By, you don't have to go read a 1,000-page commentary. You could go listen to the podcast. So hope, hopefully that helps. So do that. Please do that before next week because next week is the six trumpets, and next week is some demon locusts coming out of the abyss. You might want to listen to the podcast about what that's all about because uh, that can get pretty confusing. All right, then we get into chapter 6. And that's where the book starts getting pretty challenging, frankly. Because uh, chapter 6 is, is where we go, oh, I don't get what's going on. I'm on random play. And we need to work a little harder to figure this out. So a challenge for us today is for all of us, me included, I'm still learning this book. Are we going to take the effort? To learn it, because it takes a little bit more work. And all I could do is stand here and testify to you that this book has changed my life. Radically changed my, wife, my life. For the good, I feel like I worship more. I feel like I worship closer to God. I pray more. I'm with Jesus on mission more. This book changes people because it's Jesus. And as Jose likes to say, Jesus changes everything. So... Why is this chapter so, so difficult to understand? Well, it's because it talks about war and all sorts of famine and judgment. So that's going to take some work. And the other thing it's going to take is humility. Humility approaching the Bible is important. A double dose of humility is really important when we approach the book of Revelation. Let me read you a quote from N.T. Wright. 
a, a, a scholar who knows the book well, and he says this about Revelation. It, it's a British guy, so the quote is a little British sounding. He says this. This is a book designed to go on making you ponder and pray. Not one to design, not one designed to answer everything to your satisfaction. And that is so good. The, this book will make us ponder and pray. It's not going to answer every question. I don't know all the answers to Revelation, but, but I ponder and pray about a lot of them. So what do we ponder? What do we ask ourselves? One of the things to ask ourselves continually is why did Jesus give us this particular vision? Why is Jesus communicating in this way? Why is there an interlude here? Why fill in the blank? Why ask yourselves why, why, why? So chapter 6 has war, bloodshed, famine, death, wrath, judgment. And we go, wow, these are challenging, challenging subjects. Jose, when he preached on that passage, he said, we're living in a war zone. And that is so true. We are living in a war zone. And that's the chapter that has the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And a side note, this is one of the most famous images out of the book of Revelation. The four horsemen, along with 666. That's what Hollywood likes to portray. But those are not the most important images in the book. What's the most important image? We already said. Jesus is the lamb. That's the most important. The four horsemen are important. Jose read a quote. I'm going to read part of it. And this is kind of the punchline of the quote. It says, he said, visions, this is from, by the way, Dr. Robert Mounts, visions at best are meant to be experienced rather than analyzed. Those who approach Revelation with a sympathetic imagination are most apt to understand its true meaning. That's so good. The four horsemen describe this world of sin and evil, and we're still living in that world today. So then chapter 6 ends with this all-important sixth seal. And what's that seal all about? The last verse of chapter 6 says, For the great day of the wrath has come. Who can withstand it? So this, the sixth seal talks about the day, the day of the Lord. That's the subject that we're going to talk about next week week quite a bit. We're going to talk about God's wrath. But for now, just know that God's wrath is, uh, is targeted against all forms of evil. And then we're going to talk about that quite a bit next week. I, ho I hope you're excited to talk about God's wrath. <laughs> I am. I, just, I figured out one day that, that you can't really fully understand the book of Revelation until we understand a little bit more about God's wrath. We talk about his love all the time, and we should, but what we don't talk about is how his wrath is motivated by his love. So come, come next week to learn about that. So who could withstand it? Who could withstand the day of wrath? Well, chapter 7 answers that question. And in chapter 7, we get these two visuals, two images. One is of the 144,000. And that's a picture of God's people. And the point of that is that those 144,000 are sealed so if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you're sealed. So think protected. You're protected. And then the second image is this great multiple, multitude that no one could count. And they're from every nation, tribe, people, and language. That's a repeated phrase we see throughout the book of Revelation. And what are they doing? They're standing. So chapter 6 at the end said, who could withstand the day of wrath? The answer is here. Those who are standing before the throne, the great multitude. That's us if you're a follower of Jesus. We can withstand it. That doesn't mean we're not going to have tribulations and trials and sickness and, and job difficulties and economic strife. But we could withstand the day of wrath. And that's good news. That's part of the gospel. The part of the gospel is that Jesus' victory brings us along with him through the day of wrath. Now, one other thing I want to mention, just because of the environment we're in in the last 12 months with all sorts of divisive talk and all sorts of craziness, notice that there's no place for racism in the kingdom of God. No place for racism. We're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with every nation, tribe, language, and people. Blacks, whites, Hispanic, there will be no more racism. There's a day coming where the evil of racism is ended. And that's a judgment day, and that's good news if you're a follower of Jesus. So here's kind of a crazy thing, totally hypothetical, totally theoretical. But the book could have ended after chapter 7. 
It could have. Because we've had the day of wrath. We've had the day of judgment. We have people around God's throne. It's kind of the end, right? But Jesus reveals more. He gives us more. All the stuff we find in these last chapters are an extra gift. It's like a bonus gift from Jesus so that we could find out more. So I, I want to do now is talk about these next chapters as a, as a group because I really want to help you understand the format, how it flows, so you're not on random play. So this next slide will outline the next eight or nine chapters. And the ch that slide ch starts with chapter six to eight through five. And if you look at that slide, we've already gone through the six seals, the interlude, that was chapter seven, and then at the end of the day, I'll take just a few minutes, we'll talk about the seventh seal. But then the next ch chunk of chapters, eight through 11, moves into the six trumpets. That's next week. So please read ahead, watch, listen to the podcast, come prepared for that. And then there's another interlude, and it's there for a purpose as well. And we'll, we'll talk about why that interlude is there. And then the seventh, seventh trumpet. Now at this point, you might think, well, what's logically next? The first bowl, right? No, that's not the way the vision comes out. The next three chapters are about the dragon, Satan, and the two beasts, the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth. The second beast is what's known as the false prophet, the one identified with 666. And then there's chapter 14, which is the response to all that evil. And those would be some real fun chapters to go through. And then after that, we call it a detour in the podcast because it's an important detour. We need to learn about the unholy trinity, the dragon and the two beasts. We need to learn about Satan's deception before we move into chapters 15 and 16, which are about the bowls, the seven bowls of wrath. And what we see there is no interlude between the sixth and the seventh. Why is that? Because it's, it's the final end. It's the end. So we don't need an interlude there. Something to, to notice as we look through those chapters, uh, they're not organized like a Westerner would or organize them as a linear thinker. You know, I, if I put an interlude between the sixth and seventh seal and the sixth and seventh trumpet, I'd probably put one between the bowls, but John doesn't. That detour in those extra chapters about the dragon and the beast and the response, that's just different. So it's easy to get confused. So, so we need to keep our roadmap good. I would take a picture of this. Write it down. I have something like this written in my Bible. So if I do get a little lost, I can go back. And after a while, be, you'll get really, really comfortable with it. Now, another, I need to open Pandora's box here a little bit. There's another topic that comes up with this. And it's a question of when. When does this stuff happen? Now, please stop and hear me. I think most people's problems reading the book of Revelation is this question. It's so wrapped around the axle of trying to figure out when this stuff happens, we ignore what's happening. The point of the book is what's happening and why it's happening and getting a revelation about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God, darkness and how Jesus is victorious in the end in the kingdom of, of, of heaven. Now, because people ask that, we're going to throw up a really complex slide. So as this slide comes up, prepare to be really confused. Past, present, future. These central sections of the, of the book, some people think it's in the past. Some people think it's in the present. Some people think it's in the future. And you're probably saying, oh, I wonder what Steve thinks about that. And I think, yes, that's what I think. I think some of it's past, some of it's present, some of it's future. And we have to be humble. And people that primarily think it's all past or primarily think it's all future, that's okay. Again, the point is what's going on? Why is this happening? What's this tell us about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven? So with that, I want to point out one thing that's kind of important with the, the seals, trumpets, and bowls. They all tend to end at the same future event because everybody agrees Jesus hasn't come back yet, right? That's a future event. Everybody agrees that the day of the Lord, day of judgment is at the end. And we've already seen that the sixth seal is the day of the Lord. It's, it's the end. It's the day of judgment. Where we're going to see that again the last day in, at the end of the trumpets in chapter 11, verse 15. Don't turn there, but this is what it says. Chapter 11, verse 15 says, The kingdom of the world has become 
the kingdom of the Lord and his Messiah. So that's another picture of the end of time, at the end of the trumpets. And then at the end of the bowls in chapter 16, we read in verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. That might make you think about the cross, which Jesus said is finished, but it is done. This is the last day, final day judgment at the end of the bowls. So the the seals, trumpets, and bowls all end at the day of judgment. At least that's what the majority opinion says. And one of the reasons we know, excuse me, know that is there's this phrase that's repeated in all three spots. Scholars call that a literary marker. It's to help us. It's like a foot stomper. It's to help us to say these are all the same points of time. And this is what that phrase is. Peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now, if that doesn't sound like day of judgment... Uh, you, you haven't really read it that closely. And every one of those passages will have something like that. This is a vision of judgment, the day of the Lord. One last thing, and then we'll move into the seventh seal. One last thing about the relationship between the seals, trumpets, and bowls. There is an escalation as we go through them. In the seals, we hear that a quarter of the earth is destroyed. In the trumpets, we hear that a third of the earth is destroyed. Now, I think these are symbolic numbers, by the way, because that actually hasn't happened. And then moved forward to the, the bowls, it says all the earth is destroyed. So there's a progression as we go from the seals to the trumpets to the bowls. But they all culminate in the final same day. So, is everybody good? Or is your mind just mush? I hope your mind is not mush. That was super, super, super fast. But I think it's better to do that to review and then overview the future before we, unless we just could have just jumped right into the trumpets. And uh, when we do that next week, I think you're going to realize why we did this week because it's a spectacular off the charts passage about demon locusts and demon calfrey and stuff coming out of the abyss and scorpions. And, you, you know, we want to get warmed up a little bit. So this was the warm up uh, before we get into that next week. And we're going to bring meaning to that. But for today, to end our time today, what I want to do is drive into the seventh seal, because it's just five verses, interestingly. Chapter 8, 1 through 5. So let me read them, and then we'll make a few comments, and then we'll finish our time worshiping together. Chapter 8, 1 through 5. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's that phrase that will be repeated at the end of the trumpets and the end of the bowls. So a couple, couple things to know, a couple things to jot down or think about or ponder about. Verse 1 says there's silence in heaven for about a half hour. Now one of the things that's challenge about Revelation, and again, the podcast will really help you out with this, is which one of these images are significant and which ones aren't. The silence in heaven, I think, is hugely significant. I'll tell you why in a second. That it's a half hour, I, I can't find a good answer to that. And, and most of the commentators I read, they don't make a big deal out of that. But the silence in heaven, that's a big deal. Because throughout the Old Testament, we hear about silence prior to judgment. Here's one example. Zephaniah 1 verse 7. It says, be silent before the, so the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. That day of the Lord is a day of judgment. So there's many references to that in the Old Testament. And that's how we are to interpret the book. We go back to the Old Testament and figure out what these images are talking about. Well, then we talk about the trumpets in the next verse. And again, these five verses are a little bit unique. Uh, it's because the five verses are simultaneously the end of the seals and the beginning of the trumpets. There's an interlocking overlap. So don't let that confuse you. That's just the way John vision pans out. And then there's this golden censer, a pan of fire holding burning incense. And it's representative of the prayers of God, God's people. And they go up to God. And God hears this prayer. And he responds. 
And then the angel throws the fire to earth. Just an incredible vivid image of judgment. Because fire throughout the entire Old Testament is mostly representative of judgment. So that's, that's what's going on here. And let's be candid. Let's be transparent. Talking about judgment makes us uncomfortable, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd rather talk about cozy Jesus. The, the fire I like is the one in my fireplace when I have a cup of coffee and I read my scriptures and I, and I read wonderful passages like, come to me all who are weary and heaven bur- burden, I'll give you rest. That's what I want to read about when I talk about Jesus. But Jesus says more than that, right? Here's just one example, Luke 12, verse 49. Jesus, Jesus speaking, I have come to bring fire on the earth. You could almost substitute the word judgment there. I have come to bring judgment on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Wow. I mean, that's one of the roles of Jesus in the future. He's going to put an end to all this mucky stuff we live in, the yuck and junk and racism and divisiveness and hatred and murders, and I can go on and on and on, and you can too, because the world is full of sin and evil, and Jesus, by his grace and glory, is going to bring that to an end, but it takes a day of judgment to do that, and in the weeks to come, we're going to help you deal with that tension between those two ideas, and then we read the peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, earthquake, and I've already and I've already talked about that. So, I hope this is getting you excited to get in the Book of Revelation. So now, as we as we approach our time of worship, go ahead and close up your Bibles, close up your apps. I just want to just talk to you, person to person. Here at 26 West, our goal, as we've said all along, is to help people experience life in Jesus. Well, how do we do that? Well, one way is the way Jose talked about the last three Sundays. The church is a house. It's, it's, it's a family. It's, it's a field, right? Church is our home. and all this, this is the way we do this. And this allows us to help people experience life in Jesus. And one of the ways we have to do this is, is we need to learn more about Jesus. Not just for knowledge's sake, but to implement There's this promise in chapter 1, verse 3 of Revelation that says, He blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says. We can't just hear it and learn it and have head knowledge. It has to move down to our very being and be be applied. But it's a challenge. Again, I'm just being brutally honest. This book is harder than the typical book, right? I mean, we just don't know apocalyptic literature that well. We don't know the Old Testament that well. So here's my challenge to you today. And it's a challenge. Hopefully you hear this out of love. It doesn't matter if you're 12 years old or 82 years old. Are you up for the challenge? It's going to take some time. And if it's going to take some time, we have to make some time. We have to remove something. Maybe you skip one Netflix show or you skip a sporting event or you get rid of Facebook. Whatever it is for you you got to carve out the time. There's nothing wrong with those things. I watch Netflix. I watch sporting events. I use Facebook for what, looking at pictures of my grandkids. That's an exciting part of my day. You know, my wife and I are just always challenged. Look, Facebook. We get to watch a picture of the kids, right? But that's all we use it for because I don't want to get involved with all that nasty talk that's on Facebook. But are we going to do something? Are we going to skip something to make time? And it's going to take review and repetition. And that's why we did that today. We reviewed some chapters. It's some repetitive stuff. Bottom line is, are we willing to become learners, apprentices, students, disciples of Jesus? Are are we willing to do that? And And it's going to take humility to do that. Because you're going to want to figure this book all out. And you're not going to be able to. Because we can't figure out the king of the universe. There's parts that we're not going to understand, but that's okay. We just got to go closer to Jesus. Now, with that, you might be going, man, Steve's like, he's kind of laying down the hammer. He's telling me I got to skip my favorite show and read about demon locusts. Well, let me encourage you. I truly, truly, truly believe that this is not the hardest book of the Bible. I used to think that. But it's actually not that hard if you take some time to learn it. It's a little bit like when you're a kid and you want to learn how to ride a bicycle. 
you tried, and what did you, you fell off of it, you skinned your knees, you might have lost a tooth or two, but you kept on getting on the bike, and you kept on running, and eventually you, something clicked, and you kind of got it, and you were able to make your way down the road, and, and, and you were able to navigate riding a bike. And you're still a little wobbly at first, and we're going to be wobbly at first as we look into the book of Revelation, because it's tough. But the more we're into it, and the more we review it, the easier it's going to be, and then we're going to get to experience life with Jesus. I'm going to end today by just reading one verse out of chapter 8, verse 4, and then we'll pray together. So close your eyes, please, and listen to this, Revelation 8, verse 4. This is about prayers, and I want to picture yourself in this scene. Picture yourself in this scene. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Lord, we pray as a community of believers, as 26 West Church here in this room, online, those who are listening to the, to the, the, uh, the video cast later, Lord, we know, we know that we know that you hear our prayers and you respond to us. So Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us one godly thing to pray for today. One godly thing to send up to you, before you, to set before you, and may God's people say, amen. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your
your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord it's why we're looking at the revelation of jesus is to know him the the point isn't just knowledge about the future it's about experiencing the love and the presence of god in the now like today and so one of the beautiful things that jesus left us was very tangible tactical things that aren't just theory uh, he said whenever you get together when with other jesus people here's what i want you to do remember me like well how do we remember him and then he gave his disciples a piece of bread that was very symbolic. Uh, God is the one, by the way, who, who fed Israel out in the desert with bread. And so Jesus takes the bread and he gives it to his disciples and say, says to them, take, eat, remember me. Jesus is the one who feeds us. He's the one who gives us new life. And don't forget my body, he says. Why? Because he was about to go to the cross to rescue us. And so if you have your communion little cup, if you're here, uh, if you're at home, please uh, grab a piece of bread. Grab a, a cracker. We're like stepping into Revelation, which is like pictures and symbols. This is a picture of the body of God. God, who knew no sin, in Jesus became the sin offering for you and for me so that we could be brought into the right with him so we remember we take we eat we say jesus you are mine and then he gave them a cup and he said this cup is the new agreement which is in my blood he took wine in their day and they they knew exactly what what he was referring to it was the lamb that was slain and the innocent in their sacrifice made healing and wholeness and forgiveness for the guilty one. And Jesus is saying, you're guilty. But my blood, my life is enough to set you free. Uh, today we're remembering Jesus. And we're remembering that when in that occasion where they had that meal, Jesus also said these words. Just listen, John 14. If you love me, obey my commands. Oh, like don't just like like me. Actually follow my way. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you, the Holy Spirit. Uh, today, as we eat and drink, we always want to think about what this means. I think the reminder is that as we press into this part of the Bible, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is sent to lead you and guide you into truth. There are things about Jesus he wants to reveal to your soul and here's, here's what you don't have to worry about. I'm going to miss it. You're not going to miss it because the Holy Spirit has been given to you so you can now experience the presence of God and walk in his ways and live. All right, we're going to eat and drink and remember him. But let me just ask you this question. Are you actually following Jesus? Are you, are you, are you actually following him? Have you, have you said, you know what, Jesus? My sin, my shame, my guilt. I give it to you, and I pick up life because you died and rose again for me. If you haven't, friend, this is not for you yet. It's for those of us who said, I have nothing but sin and shame and regret, but I receive grace and mercy and new life in Jesus. And you say, Jose, I want that. Well, then just talk to him right now. Right now, before we eat and drink, and just say, Jesus, forgive me and set me free. Friend, he'll do that for you. If you're watching online, there's going to be a button pop up on the side that says, today, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And I'm going to invite you to do something tangible. I'm going to invite you, if you're watching on the screen, to just click on that button. And by clicking, you're saying, that's me. Today, I want to choose to follow Jesus. And if you're here in the building, here's what I want you to do. When we eat and drink, I just want you to say before God, in your own way, Jesus, today, I'm choosing to follow you. Forgive me. I'm yours. And he'll do it. Well, let's invite him. Lord, thank you that your presence is real. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are God. Come into our life to reveal what's right and true about you and what needs healing and wholeness in our own soul. Holy Spirit of God, we open our lives to, to your work.
to open our eyes to our need for Jesus, to open our eyes to his love and forgiveness, to open our minds to how to obey the commands, the beautiful commands that you've laid out for us. Today, we receive you tangibly. We eat and we drink and remember your beautiful sacrifice for our good. And we also go eating and drinking, remembering that this is part of obedience. Lord, we want to walk in your ways this week. We want to actually live out what we know to be true. Enable us, Holy Spirit, to live out the way of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. At home, here in the building, I'm going to invite you to eat and drink and remember the goodness of Jesus. We're going to sing one other song, remembering his victory in our life. And this week, we're going to choose to follow his commands. Amen.
Jesus has won the victory in your life and in mine. We celebrate that. Hey, we had someone online, and I want to speak to you, who, who raised your hand vi virtually to say, I want to choose to commit my life to Jesus Christ. Hey, let's just celebrate that. We want to thank God for what he's doing. At the same token, I want to give you the same opportunity here. If you're here on the count of three real quick, you say, Jose, I, I'm no joking. I've heard this before. I've kind of been walking around it, thinking about it. But today I've chosen to follow Jesus. Don't be ashamed. We want to tell each other so we can celebrate each other and rejoice in what God is doing in our life. Is that, if that's you, just on the count of three, just raise it up real quick and put it down. One, two, three. Anyone here in the building who said, today I chose to follow Jesus? Great, great. I didn't see a hand go up, but we always give the opportunity because you never know when Jesus wants to change your life and you're ready to receive him. Well, hey, guys, as you get ready to go and you online, one of Jesus' commands is that we live for one another. And so Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. Press down, shaken, and running over in abundance. Will God return back to you as you live the way of generosity? If this is your church, we uh, remember here uh, because of COVID, we don't pass anything around. Uh, but there is a bowl on the way out. If you're here in the building online, all you need to do is click the give button. For the rest of us, can I just encourage you, make it a regular part of your generosity plan. And even make a commitment. You can go in our PushPay app and do recurring giving. You could say if you get, if you get paid once a month, do you know what? By faith, I'm gonna I'm gonna give back to God once a month. We get paid every week. Well, every week that God gives me some resource, I'm gonna give back not to a building or a person or a church, but to Him. And you never know what God will do through your obedience. So I encourage you to live generously. God is faithful. Well, we love you, and we can't wait to worship together. If you're one of our students, middle school, high school, don't forget, right here on Wednesday night, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock for the rest of us. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. Walk with Jesus. We love you, and thank you, Jared, and thank you, Carrie, for leading us in worship this morning. Have a fantastic week.